three men were found dead on the train at Trieste. One of them was Grant. What have you to say in number five? Blofeld, of course, was indeed never seen. At the beginning, the hands appeared in stroking the white cat with the voice off screen. Exactly. What have you to say to that, number three? Blofeld is the ultimate adversary of Bond, obviously, and there's been this real build-up during the series, and from Russia with Love, the sort of shots of him stroking the cat. But what makes you think that British intelligence will oblige you by falling in with your plan? And then you get in Thunderball, you see him, you don't get the face, but you just sort of see bits of him in the Paris headquarters. Are you quite sure all monies have been accounted for by yourself? To the penny, number one. Finally, and you only live twice, you get to see the man. So there's been all this build-up, you know there's going to be something special happening. Before Blofeld was finally revealed, the cinema audience were to be teased with the now customary shots of him stroking his cat. Except this time round, the cat had become as camera shy as his master. You see, the stuff with the cat all went on behind me, so I never really saw what was going on. I heard that there were difficulties. The cat wouldn't sit still, or the cat wanted to scratch. You are to assume full control of operation from now on. I remember that cat particularly, and I remember the shot particularly, because somebody fired a gun, and this cat went off like a rocket. We couldn't find him. We, he went shot away and ran up into the roof of the studio. So we've got to get up there. And we spent the next hour trying to find the cat. I shall be in my apartment. With the cat finally retrieved and an army of extras assembled in the vast volcano set, a new problem arose. This time with Jan Verik, the actor booked to play Blofeld. To my amazement, when he turned up, he looked a bit like Father Christmas. He didn't look like a villain at all. And when we started to shoot, it was even worse because his English was pretty poor. So, of course, I said that this is absolutely hopeless, you know, and here we were on this huge set and no Blofeld and we just couldn't find anybody until somebody said to me that Donald Pleasance was available. You made a mistake, my friend. No astronaut would enter the capsule carrying his air conditioner. In that particular scene, he's sort of stroking the cat, and you can see his hand, and as he sort of slowly spins around, you see what appears to be a normal person, and as the sort of camera pans... I am Ernst Stavro Blofeld. They told me you were assassinated in Hong Kong. Yes, this is my second life. He looks like he's been melted. It looks like someone's taken a blowtorch to the side of his face. You only live twice, Mr. Bond. Target vehicle passing over central Russia. And you think, oh, well, that's why we've never seen it before. If I don't like that, I wouldn't want to be on camera either. As you see, I am about to inaugurate a little war. The disfigured face of Donald Pleasance has become one of the cinema's most famous images, but the scar was actually a last-minute afterthought. Donald Pleasance was not a very imposing figure, and the feeling was when he turned up on the set dressed that he should have something a bit more extraordinary looking. There were things like hunchbacks and dragging feet, and I think everything had been talked about. Remove his suit and search him. Time was getting on with this huge set and 400 extra standing by, and we thought, well, we better go with Donald with his scar. This is the price of failure, Mr. Bond. So unnecessary. But somehow James Bond has always been able to talk his way out of dangerous situations and into the affections of many a young woman. He is the man with the silver tongue and the best one liners in the business. Ah, yes, the legendary 007 wit. It's the, the wit of it that I think made those films so wonderful. Is anything the matter, Sir Hillary? Just a slight stiffness coming on. Bond has a sense of humour. It may be quite a vicious one at times, but he does have a sense of humour. I think he got the point. With Connery, the humour was a little bit dark, but it fitted in perfectly with the, with the films, with the stories, and particularly with that character. I remember one when he was dancing with somebody. One of my friend's sisters went out. She's just dead. 
you look after my friend? She's just dead. Just brought the house down. I always look for humor in whatever I'm doing, in uh, no matter how serious or whatever. Shocking. I think it tells stories better. Positively shocking. It takes people along to where you want to go better. Moore takes it so much more towards being a pastiche, almost, of what the Connery was doing. Play it again, Sam. Definitely. He's in it for the laughs. Paul, what do you think you're doing? Keeping the British hand up, sir. James? Vince was underway for some Where are you? Oh, money, Penny. With Pierce, um, we've tried to make it more of the ironic style of humor. I'm just up here at Oxford, brushing up on a little Danish. Nowadays, it's Little. more even. My money penny is allowed to absolutely get as many good put downs and, and as many double entendres as he does. So, uh, you always were a cunning linguist, James. I did enjoy saying you always were a cunning linguist, James. I did enjoy that. Not all 007s have been quite so lucky in love. When an unknown Australian called George Lazenby took on the role, he did something no other James Bond had done before or has done since. He turned his Bond girl into a Bond bride. It was just bound to end in tears. Only now. James, where have you been? Much too far from you, darling. Oh, same old James. Oh, only more so. On Her Majesty's Secret Service has now come to be kind of reclaimed as one of the great bonds. <laughs> it's true! George Lazenby was a, a model and had done a very good commercial, nothing to do with us, for Fry's Chocolate. The only problem was the boy had never acted before. Big Fry! <laughs> Thought I could make him act. He was very malleable. Now you go on action, George. Five, sixteen, take three. He's the one Bond that you really feel could handle himself. That's really got that physical presence, and he got it. I think he got the film because he auditioned really well in a fight scene. All right, action! Ooh. But okay. then they said, "Can he talk?" And I had this mad Australian accent. You know, good eye, mate. How are you? I'm from Australia. <laughs> So they sent me along to this voice coach, I can't remember her name, but Harold Wilson was coming out of there when I was going in. Forgive me, my mind was elsewhere. Madame has forgotten we agreed to be partners this evening. Please continue. Lazenby's challenge wasn't just playing the leading role with no previous acting experience. He was asked to take Bond into new territory as the womanizing hero gives up his philandering for the love of a good woman. Why do you persist in rescuing me, Mr. Bond? It's becoming a habit, isn't it, Contessa Teresa? Teresa was a saint. I'm known as Tracy. You warm more to Bond, I think, in On the Majesty's Secret Service because you see him as a real guy with real emotions. In this, you see him actually falling in love, and you see them in a kind of montage sequence, you know, romancing each other with, you know, we have all the time in the world playing in the background. It is a love story, and that's great. Every step of the way We'll find out. It turned out with uh, We Have All the Time in the World that it, uh, it was Louis Armstrong's last recording. He'd been very ill, he'd been in hospital, came to New York and we recorded. We have all the time in the world. He did it in two takes. Just one kind of a touching moment. Nothing more. Nothing less. And it adds to the layering of the film where Bond is revealing a feminine side, if you like, that, that in most of the other films, he, he, you know, he, he wouldn't go near revealing. Ladies and gentlemen, the toast is the bride and bridegroom, Mr. and Mrs. James Bond. I so wanted him to get, you know, so wanted to get hooked. I'm like, yes, but it can't possibly happen, can it? Something horrible is going to happen, and he did. He loves me. Instinctively. Infuriatingly. Intensely. In 